Hello and welcome to this episode of Psych Boost. In this video, we'll be looking at our first approach. We'll be looking at the behaviourist approach to understanding our psychology. We will try and define a few aspects of behaviourism as we look at three of the classical researchers. And those researchers are Watson, Pavlov and Skinner. We're going to learn lots of specialist terminology along the way, all relating to operant and classical conditioning. At the end of the video, we'll evaluate the behaviourist approach to psychology. One. Two. Three. Okay, so in front of us we can see three of the most important researchers in the behaviourist school. Watson, Pavlov and B.F. Skinner. Watson pioneered the field with a piece of research focusing on one nine-month-old boy. This nine-month-old boy, he gave a phobia of small, fluffy creatures to, which is clearly very unethical by today's standards, but really went on to shape our ideas about how learning affects behaviour. We'll also look at the work of Pavlov. Pavlov wasn't a psychologist. Pavlov was a Russian scientist who was interested in digestion, and during his work on the digestive systems of dogs, noticed an unusual effect. The dogs would salivate before they saw the food. They would salivate as they heard the researchers walking towards them down the corridor. That made Pavlov wonder what the process was by which the dogs had come to associate the sound of the feet with the food. And we'll look at the experiments that he ran on classical conditioning. And then there's also B.F. Skinner. Skinner's really famous for his Skinner box, where he placed rats and pigeons inside a contraption which would give food. The food would be released after the pigeon or the rat had pressed a lever. There were some variations to the Skinner box, sometimes it would be lights, and sometimes the floor would be electrocuted. Skinner did a range of experiments looking at something called operant conditioning. The key principle for the behaviourist was psychology should be fundamentally scientific. The only things that could be measured objectively were the stimuli, the inputs, and the resultant behaviour, the output. The mind and any mental processes were fundamentally untestable. Trying to measure what happened within the mind was subject to bias and ultimately unnecessary for the behaviourist. So let's start with Watson. There's a quote that he's quite famous for, and it's as follows. Give me a dozen healthy infants, well formed and my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take any one at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. A doctor, a lawyer, an artist, a merchant and chief, and yes, even a beggar man and thief. Regardless of his talents, his pensions, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors. So what's John Watson trying to say from this paragraph? He's trying to say that our behaviour is fundamentally a product of our environment. Any baby can grow up to be a doctor. Any baby can grow up to be an artist. Any baby can grow up to be a thief. All that matters is the environment that they've been placed in and ideas about inherent talents, inherent intelligence, and even race wouldn't dictate, according to Watson, what could be achieved in life. This idea went quite against the thinking of most of the people of that time. This is after Darwin's theory of natural selection. And people had a strong idea that your intelligence and your talents was inherited from your parents. That explanation went a long way in explaining the differences between the social classes and the inequalities between different groups of people. But what Watson's saying is it's purely the environment that causes someone to do well. So let's have a close look at his research. The baby you can see in the video is little Albert. Now he's an eight-month-old baby boy and he was placed in an experiment and the experiment was to demonstrate the importance of the environment and learning in resultant behaviour, not instinct. Now you might think if you show a rat, if you show a fire, monkeys, dogs, and rabbits to a newborn baby, they may be initially quite nervous and scared. But as you can see, little Albert had no fear response when showing a range of stimuli. He may look a little apprehensive, but he clearly isn't too distressed. Now after a while a white rat was shown to Albert and again Albert wasn't afraid of this rat but at the same time behind his head a metal bar was hit very hard so it would make a loud noise. Consistently this white rat would be paired with the sound of the loud bar. 
Now the alarm bar would make Albert jump, and then very soon, when shown the white rat, Albert would be afraid. So we would say now that Albert has a fear response of the white rat. So after this initial conditioning, other objects were shown to Albert. It was found that he would have the same conditioned fear response with other stimuli. So the dog was shown to him again and he was afraid of the dog. He was afraid of the fur coat and he was also afraid of the Santa mask. So what Watson had found is he could condition a fear response into a baby where there wasn't a fear response before by manipulating the environment. So let's look now at Pavlov. Pavlov was a Russian scientist investigating the digestive system. What Pavlov did is he installed a collection vessel at the saliva glands of his dogs. He would give the dogs food and measure the saliva production. He discovered a process called classical conditioning. This is learning by association. What he found was as assistants would walk down the corridor with the food, the dog would start salivating before it had seen or smelt the food. He worked out that the dog had associated the sound of the feet with the food that the dog was going to get. So the dog would behave as though it already had the food. Now this is a temporal association. There are two stimuli, one the food and one the sound of feet. Because they were experienced close in time, an association was made between the two of them. Pavlov then went on to state that learning happens when a neutral stimulus, so in this case feet walking down the corridor, is constantly paired with an unconditioned stimulus. So this is the food. We say unconditioned because you didn't need to condition the dog to salivate to the food, it would do it automatically. Now when the neutral stimulus, the feet down the corridor, is consistently paired with this unconditioned stimulus, eventually the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus and produces a conditioned response which is to salivate. Pablo then went on to demonstrate this in his dogs by doing controlled experiments using a metronome and the sound of a bell. And he found with both of these, he could make the dog salivate by just the sound of the metronome or just the sound of the bell by pairing them with food. Now I know this sounds a little confusing, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break down his experiment as best I can. So here we see Pavlov with a metronome. The metronome is sounded and then the food is given to the dog. This happens again and again and again until eventually the sound of the metronome is enough to make the dog salivate. And as I've mentioned, he's also done this with a bell. So he rings the bell and then gives the food to the dog. Now at first, the sound of the bell will not make the dog draw because it's a neutral stimulus. But then as it's paired more and more with the food, it makes the dog draw. Let's put this into a diagram. So we have first of all the food. The food is the unconditioned stimulus. The dog will drool when it sees the food as it prepares to eat it and digest it. So the drool is the unconditional response. No one has to train the dog to drool when it sees the food. Now first of all, the bell is a neutral stimulus. You ring the bell, there's no response from the dog. So there's no drool from the sound of the bell. The multiple occasions of having the unconditioned stimulus, the food, resulting in the unconditioned response drooling, but at the same time pairing it with the sound of the bell, eventually the bell becomes a conditioned stimulus. The very sound of the bell makes the dog draw. So next up we've got BF Skinner. BF Skinner is known for his Skinner box, which is a device he designed to test operant conditioning. Now operant conditioning is learning by trial and error, as that animal does its voluntary responses, but then has consequences to those responses. If the consequences are reinforcing, then the behavior will be repeated. This is quite a simple Skinner box. It has a lever which delivers food, and the rat needs to figure out that pulling on the lever will release food. When first put into the box, the rat will just wander around and do a range of behaviors. Accidentally, it might pull the lever. When it pulls a lever, the food will be released, so this will be the consequence of the behaviour. Now we say there's reinforcement when the consequence of behaviour is going to increase the likelihood of that behaviour being repeated again. This reinforcement could be positive, such as here, the rat getting food. Negative reinforcement is when something is removed. Variation is designed is the floor has an electric current running, running underneath it, and then when the lever is pressed, the shocks are turned off for a short period, so there's a removal of a negative stimulus.
Now, sometimes behaviors are quite complex. And in this video, we saw at first the rat push the lever, but not notice the pellet come out. A moment later, it did notice the pellet and ate it, but it wasn't quite sure what had happened in order for it to get its pellet. Or it did know is that, that part of the cage was where it needed to be. And eventually it started to figure out that pulling on that lever would release the food. So this demonstrates shaping. This is when reinforcement will be given and the behavior is close to what we'd like the ultimate behavior to be. I'll show you in the moment some of the complex behaviors that shaping can produce. Now we've had reinforcement. So reinforcement is when something's added to increase behavior or something is taken away to increase behavior. We do also have punishment. Now a punishment decreases the likelihood of the repetition of a behavior. And punishment can be positive and it can be negative as well. What you can see here is operant conditioning used to teach pigeons how to play ping pong. The game is quite simple. If they get the ball past the other pigeon, then they get a treat. So you can see the motivation is quite strong to win this game. And as both pigeons have the same operant conditioning, they kind of play against each other. And this is just one way Skinner demonstrated the power of operant conditioning. This kind of stuff is still done today. What you can see here is an example of mouse basketball. You can see that the white mouse is pretty well trained to play basketball. Every time it gets the ball into a basket, it gets a treat. So it knows that very quickly it needs to make successive dunks. Let's go into slightly more detail about opera conditioning. We might have a few more keywords we can use. If a behavior that's been reinforced previously stops being reinforced, the behavior that was reinforcing will gradually stop happening. So if the rats in Skinner's experiment had carried on pulling that lever where it didn't release any more food, eventually the rat would stop pulling the lever. And this process is called extinction. Something we need to think about as humans, we don't necessarily just do our behaviors for what are known as primary reinforcers. So things that don't need pairing with another stimulus to be reinforcing, they're just reinforcing in themselves. And these things are like food, water, sex. These things are generally rewarding in themselves. We're motivated by secondary reinforcers. And this is due to being paired with a primary reinforcer. For example, money. Money can buy you food, so therefore you might want to have lots of money. Money is not rewarding in and of itself, but it does allow you to have primary reinforcers. A good way to think about whether something is a primary reinforcer or a secondary reinforcer is the caveman test. Think if a caveman wants it, then it's probably a primary enforcer. If you tried to give money to a caveman, he just wouldn't be interested. Another interesting aspect of operant conditioning is actually giving a reward every time for a particular behavior isn't the strongest way to make that behavior happen. Generally in life, behavior isn't reinforced every single time it happens. Now think about some behaviors like gambling and slot machines. These follow a variable ratio rule. So you win every couple of times, but it's not in a particular pattern. Now this type of reinforcement is really resistant to extinction and results in compulsive responses, which may go some way in explaining some types of addiction. And also certain types of computer games use these ideas of operant conditioning to make you play more, make you play longer, and often encourage you to make microtransactions within them. That was quite a long introduction to behaviorists. Uh, we're gonna now try and build our evaluations. So first of all, maybe we could think about the implications of behaviorist research into our daily lives. The development of laws of operant classical conditioning enables us to predict human behavior and led to the development of therapies and also ways of managing classrooms through the use of reinforcement techniques. While this may have its benefits, there are ethical considerations. The use of classical and operant conditioning has been used by gambling companies, it's been used by governments to control human behavior, and it's used by advertisers to sell its products. One thing we definitely need to give behaviors credit for is the use of objective scientific methods. They used very systematic manipulation of the variables. They only focused on behavior that could be observable. They controlled their experiments very well. And we would say the behaviorists did demonstrate cause and effect very clearly through their research. This whole approach is very deterministic. The researchers in this field would argue that the idea of free will is a complete illusion, that human behavior is completely environmentally determined. We could also say this particular area is environmentally reductionist. It focuses on a very low level of explanation for human behavior, simple stimulus response associations. Human experience seems so much richer than the idea we use operant and classical conditioning to navigate through our lives. So maybe this approach lacks validity when we try and apply it to our complex human lives. So that links on to the next point. This research was done primarily with animals, and it's very hard to generalize these findings on to human behavior, considering how much more complex and intelligent we are. Okay, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a like. If you haven't already, click subscribe to be updated with new videos. And also, if you have any questions about the content covered during this video, please drop a, a comment in the comments below. If you see a 
question and you think you can answer it, then please give that a go as well. Thank you very much. Until the next episode of Cyclist.